Bonjour, je m'appelle Ted McDonald et je suis professeur d'économie à l'Université de New Brunswick à Fredericton. J'ai aussi l'honneur d'être membre du Conseil d'administration du réseau canadien des centres de données de recherche, président du Conseil académique du réseau et directeur académique de CDR au New Brunswick. Il m'a fait plaisir de souhaiter um, la bienvenue, la bienvenue à, à tous nos participants canadiens et internationaux. Nous sommes très heureux que vous soyez de notre procès, conférence virtuelle des RTCCDR, présentée en partenariat avec Statistique Canada. Today, the, high, the spotlight is on population health and health services. We are delighted to have four panelists who will share their experience and how the CRDCN is advancing their research and informing policy. They will also discuss their aspirations for future data, research, and our policy development as part of this week's series. Looking back and looking forward, the impact of CRDCN research. Each of our panelists will provide, present opening remarks of six to seven minutes. As this portion of the panel has been pre-recorded, we invite you to submit your questions as you listen to each speaker. We'll get to as many of them as possible in the live Q&A that will follow. First off now, I would like to invite Kim McGrail, Professor of UBC School of Population and Public Health, Center for Health Services and Policy Research, Director of Research for UBC Health, and Scientific Director of Pop Data BC and of the Health Data Research Network Canada to kick off today's panel. So welcome, Kim, and over to you. Thank you for the introduction, and I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to be here and to provide a few remarks to celebrate CRDCN's anniversary and to think a bit about the past as well as the future. So as Ted said, I have a, a number of roles within UBC and beyond, and I, I just want, before I, I start speaking, to say, that, to say that I'm not speaking on behalf of any of those organizations, but I want to present a, a, my opinions. And I thought it was important to say that because I uh, would like to be a little bit um, provocative um, in the interest of seeding some good discussion, particularly on the future-facing comments that will come in the latter part of what I have to say. So as Ted noted, one of the things we were asked to do is reflect on the impact of research data centers on the research and policy related, related work of myself and my colleagues. The simple answer to that is there has been enormous positive impact. The RDC has expanded the realm of research that was even possible to consider. And to be fair, of course, the RDCs were also able to share the great progress Statistics Canada has made over the last two decades in creating and acquiring, linking, documenting and ultimately sharing data. There are impressive population health related data resources available for research through the RDCs. As just one simple example, a recent master's student of mine was able to link and use the RDC to look at the relationship between changes in minimum wages across provinces in relation to small for gestational age babies. This, this kind of research provides insights that just simply wouldn't have been possible under other circumstances or early, earlier time points. There are also some great health services research projects that are possible using the RDCs, and perhaps more importantly, research that can span social determinants of health and health services research, looking at things like equity and utilization and outcomes of healthcare systems. This is, uh, was underlined in its importance given some of the research that was actually used in the recent a court case on Canby that was decided in BC. Stepping back, the value of RDCs is in increasing access to data, but also democratizing access, or what my colleague and mentor, Professor Michael Hayes, always refers to as the friction of distance. Researchers have far more democratized access to data because the RDCs mean they don't have to go to Ottawa or even to the few large universities across Canada. This has been a great step forward. To be sure, however, there is still friction, including friction of distance, and this is a good segue to the second thing we were asked to comment on, which was to identify one area for future research that RDC researchers and policymakers could pursue collaboratively in the years ahead. I want to provide my comments on this future-facing question using the context of a grant application that we've actually put forward in partnership between CRDCN and Health Data Research Network Canada. The theme of the grant that we proposed is equality of opportunity. This theme was chosen because Canada has historically shown some achievement in this as measured by socioeconomic status transitions from one generation to another. 
that is, your social position at birth in Canada is not a firm destiny. We started working on this uh, subject area well before the pandemic because there were already suggestions or at least questions about whether there were cracks in this moderate success. This becomes even more pointed now given the way that the pandemic, our response to it, and the choices we'll make in the next short while are likely to shape experiences for all of us, perhaps, but perhaps children in particular over the decades to come. One challenge uh, to conduct this sort of research is our, in a, is the, and the reason for the partnership between CRDCN and Health Data Research Network Canada relates to data. Not all of the data of interest and importance to this work are at Statistics Canada. Some are in provinces, some are in the private sector. Not all the data required even exist at this point. And for sure, we should expect that all useful data are not going to live in one place now or in the future. One opportunity for these kinds of complex analyses addressing multi-layer issues is data science, which I'm losing, using loosely here to mean the ability to mash different data sources together. In this context, I would argue that science infrastructure is increasingly important. The purpose of science infrastructure is to ensure that researchers can spend more time doing research and less time negotiating access to resources they need for that. The uh, quote unquote need here is changing fast and in data, data intensive science and we have to respond to that. So this means that collaboration across large scale and organized data holdings is gonna be critical in the future. With the ultimate goal of low, low friction responsive processes to enable innovation by building unique combinations of data. I think about this like borrowing uh, from a library where you actually get to choose a, a number of books that you want to borrow, you license them and use them for a time and then and then give them back. In other words, we need more seamless and non-permanent linkage between and among data, including but extending well beyond provincial and federal data. This is going to require collaboration and while there's much more to say on this, I want to be clear that the future I envision has to be informed by responsive to and reflective of the wishes of the public. I mean this in a very active, involved way, and involved way that includes uh, granting power to people, recognizing both the good that can come from research, but the, also the evil that can be done when data are wielded poorly or with malicious intent. The RDCs and CRDCN have had great success and deserve our thanks for everything accomplished over the past two decades. They also uh, need our encouragement and support as we all embark on the next 20 years, which will no doubt look decidedly different. Thank you, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Kim. Um, that was great. And I know the next few years will certainly uh, involve you at the forefront, given all the hats you wear. And also, I think it's worth highlighting uh, the, the point you made about democratization, that if, unlike um, many other countries where administrative data and other census data are offered, we really do have a model that makes data as widely available as possible while still respecting confidentiality. Um, so our next speaker um, is Mohamed Hazadeh, Associate Professor at the School of Health Administration, Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia. As a health economist, Mohamed has an interest in the social determinants of health, particularly the role socioeconomic status and public policies have in shaping population health and health inequalities. Mohamed, over to you. And I'm pleased to be here to celebrate CRDC and achievement over, the, over two decades. I graduated from Australia and worked with the Australian Health Dataset during my PhD program. And I wanted to access confidential micro-level data for my analysis, and similar to what we have in the RDC, but unfortunately I couldn't access to this data set, and, and eventually I ended up to use public use data for, for my PhD like data analysis. So after I moved to Canada and started to work in Canada, first at Western Ontario, then McGill, and now at Dalhousie. I, I was quite pleased to see that, that there is a research data center that house this confidential data set, and it's open for the researcher that we can go ahead and use this data set. And as a matter of fact, I'm one of the frequent users of the data housed in the RDC. And um, I, I, I need to mention that uh, like uh, over the past two decades, I, the, the RDC network has been very instrumental in the research productivity and success of the researcher working in population health and health services research. So of course, the population health and health services research aim to find intervention and policy implication in order to effectively 
promote population health and also reduce inequity in health that we can observe in the society. So in this slide, I'm going to just uh, give you some highlight of the research that I have done with the RDC. Of course, these are just the short list that uh, short list of uh, uh, short list of the research that I have done in the RDC. So as you can see, my my research program is more specifically focused on the socioeconomic inequality in health and healthcare. And uh, for example, uh, like I have done some research on indigenous health and as well as in general population of health and as well as healthcare. So just then, uh, like uh, to highlight the importance of RDC research, I just uh, want to uh, focus on two of my studies that I have recently done. The first one is income related inequality in lengthy wait time uh, in Canada. As we know that uh, like, uh, when I moved from Australia to Canada, I noticed that there is no uh, private health insurance. So uh, if you are, we are thinking about non-emergency health services, we shouldn't have we shouldn't have differences between those people that are poor and rich in terms of the waiting time to to uh, receive the healthcare services. So because the, the because I had that in my mind, I went and then used the um, RDC dataset and analyzed the income related inequality in lengthy wait time. So I, and I find that Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Saskatchewan, these three provinces, there is an issue with uh, income related inequality uh, in wait times and those people that they are earned they, they have a higher income they tend to wait less and as you can see obviously because Nova Scotia and New Brunswick we find that there is an issue in terms of inequality uh, like it, this particular study drew a lot of a policy and also um, uh, and media attention locally in Atlantic region and the second study that I would like to highlight is about inequality in mental health among indigenous population. We know that there is inequality in health between indigenous and non-indigenous population, but in this particular study, uh, we wanted to see that uh, whether there is income-related inequality within indigenous population themselves. And if there is, what factor is in fact contributing to this inequality? And if you can see that, uh, uh, like for example, in terms of psychological distress, there is income related inequality and 40% of this income related inequality actually explained by food insecurity. In other words, if you go ahead and address this issue in terms of the food insecurity uh, within indigenous population, you are going to resolve 40% of the inequality that we, we can see. And this, this is also not only draw the local attention in terms of the um, policy implication and also as well as the national media outlet also capture this uh, research. And this is because of the fact is that we have Aboriginal People House House Survey, um, Aboriginal People House Survey housed in RDC that we can access. So, um, in terms of the uh, in, in terms of the growth in the number of number and quality of administrative and linked survey administrative data, I think that this is the right direction that we can see at the uh, at the. Uh, RDC and nowadays we talk about big data set and access to a vast array of information to conduct our analysis. So for example, these are some of the example, some of the example of the administrative and linked, uh, linked administrative data that we can have access to the data at the RDC. I use some of them for my analysis and I think that having that one, uh, having this type of data is, is quite uh, important for population health and health services researcher. Just then I, as some of the example that I have done in terms of using administrative data, I use the Can Canadian Cancer Registry data and Canadian uh, Census data and National Health uh, Survey in order to find trends in socioeconomic inequality in different cancer types in Canada. So we find both negative and as well as we some in some cases we couldn't find any association. So this uh, I want to uh, highlight it in this slide as well that um, CRDCN also uh, quite uh, helpful in terms of the capacity built building of the future health services and population health researcher. Specifically, for example, in this case, I have uh, eight, uh, eight uh, students that they are working in different types of related type of topics at the, at the research data center. So what is my vision for the future? And, and I feel that uh, 
um, if you are thinking about the future of the uh, like a research data center network. And I feel that uh, at the beginning, I said Australian researcher, uh, they didn't have the virtual access at the time of the, my PhD program, but now they have a virtual access to the confidential data that we have similar type of data that, that we have at the research data center. And I think that uh, moving forward to get access uh, data set outside of RDC, in a, in a confidential manner. So I think it's something that uh, increased number of the people they are using the data set. And, and the other thing is that if it is not possible to include national level data sets such as a, a Canadian Cancer Registry data in the RDC network, how, you know, I would like to see that uh, maybe there is a possibility to include provincial level uh, data set at the RDC. And this is actually quite helpful because as a researcher at the university, we are not, uh, if, even if we don't have a grant, we can go ahead and do the uh, research at the, by accessing the research data center survey for free. And I think that this is, uh, this can be also quite uh, uh, helpful for low, uh, to do the research analysis at the provincial level and pay back to the local community that we are, uh, we, 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 are we, we are actually located. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mohammed. I think the, the focus of the relation, interrelationships between social inequality and health outcomes, we as social scientists have, have known for a while. And I think it's very encouraging that with the kind of attention that your research is getting, the policymakers are increasingly be, becoming up, embracing that this is an important issue, not just in terms of lip service, but actually designing policy aimed at preventing uh, adverse health outcomes rather than treating them after the fact. Uh, maintenant, il me fait maintenir uh, plaisir d'inviter Madame Emily Quesnel Vallée, la laureate uh, 2019-2020 de la Fulbright Canada Distinguished Chair in Quebec Studies à SUNY Plattsburgh, à prendre la parole. Elle est professeure à l'Université de McGill, où est uh, titulaire de la chaire Recherche du Canada en politique et égalité sociale de santé. Madame Quesnel Vallée, à vous la parole. Merci beaucoup et comme mes collègues, je suis ravie d'être en mesure ici de célébrer l'anniversaire du Réseau canadien des centres de données et de recherche et de souligner l'apport fondamental que l'accès aux données qui nous a permis euh, a vraiment donné pour l'avancement la, des recherches que je conduis sur les inégalités de, de santé à travers les parcours de vie qui requiert des données longitudinales qui sont, dont la confidentialité est vraiment très importante et, sans, et donc sans, sans les centres de données de recherche, euh, ces recherches n'auraient probablement pas été capables ou en, possibles ou en tout cas beaucoup plus difficiles à, à conduire. Donc euh, ici, je veux vous montrer juste euh, un peu ce dont je parle quand je parle des, des parcours de vie et euh, je vais partager mon écran. Donc, la question des parcours de vie euh, souligne que la santé des individus, le statut social et la position des individus se fait à travers le temps et commence en fait à travers, avec même le statut de leurs parents et, euh, et se, se déroule comme ça sur les parcours de vie des individus, parfois de façon beaucoup plus erratique ou euh, plus cohérente. Et euh, c'est là où les données longitudinales sont particulièrement importantes et Statistique Canada s'est trouvé dans les années 1990 à innover parmi les agences de statistiques en lançant plusieurs grandes enquêtes longitudinales, dont l'enquête nationale sur la santé des populations que j'ai utilisée et ici. Je vous présente juste un exemple de la recherche que ça a permis. Donc, le devis longitudinal de l'enquête nationale sur la santé des populations a permis à Alison Park de faire sa recherche euh, de maîtrise sur l'effet de l'éducation des parents sur la santé mentale des enfants 20 ans dans le futur. Donc, euh, le NSP avait parmi ses répondants des adultes, évidemment, mais aussi des enfants qui ont vieilli à travers l'enquête. Et donc, ça nous a permis vraiment d'étudier leur, euh, ces associations à travers le temps, alors qu'elles euh, se déroulaient, et en utilisant évidemment des facteurs intermédiaires qui nous permettaient de voir, euh, peut-être de se rapprocher plus de mécanismes et de causalité en, dans ces facteurs-là. Donc, on a vu, par exemple, dans cette étude, que euh, les mères qui avaient un niveau d'éducation plus faible que le niveau secondaire, euh, avaient des enfants qui, à l'âge adulte, étaient beaucoup plus à risque de, dé de dépression majeure euh, que ceux dont les mères n'avaient pas ce, ce déficit euh, éducationnel. Et euh, 
qui est important de noter, par contre, c'est que les, les données longitudinales ont ceci, cette limitation, que lorsqu'elles euh, vieillissent à travers le temps, elles deviennent moins représentatives de la population. Donc, euh, après avoir euh, conduit ces, ces enquêtes pendant plusieurs années, Statistique Canada dans les années 2010 euh, ou environ, euh, a cessé la conduite de ces enquêtes, mais par ailleurs, à innover de l'autre côté parce que ces investissements de temps, des répondants d'argent euh, de l'enquête pouvaient encore servir à informer la prise de décision. Et c'est là où les données administratives sont entrées en jeu. Donc, le couplage avec les données administratives a permis d'améliorer de, de, la pérennité, d'assurer de, de, la pérennité de ces données et aussi de se rapprocher un peu plus de la prise de décision. Et c'est, euh, j'ai eu le, le plaisir d'en faire partie. La première fois que j'ai entendu parler de cette possibilité qu'on pouvait coupler des données administratives, je me suis dit, je suis comme un enfant dans le magasin de bonbons. Il y a tellement de possibilités que ça semble euh, ouvrir. Et donc, euh, j'ai eu l'opportunité d'utiliser un, un exemple de cette innovation très importante qui est l'ELIA, l'enquête longitudinale internationale sur les adultes. Et... Euh, sur laquelle je travaille depuis plusieurs années, qui, elle, est, une, je dirais, une hybride, donc qui a couplé dès, le premier, dès la première vague en 2012 les données administratives euh, de, de, de revenus, notamment celles que j'utilise, depuis les années 1980. Donc, vous voyez déjà, on a une, une possibilité de refaire un, un historique du parcours de vie des individus dès la première vague de l'enquête. Cependant, euh, ce que j'ai réalisé également à l'utilisation de ces données, c'est que les données administratives nous disent beaucoup sur les gens qui sont présents dans les données, dans les, dans les, dans les enquêtes administratives. Ce qui veut dire, par exemple, si on prend l'invalidité, qu'on a beaucoup sur ces individus qui ont vécu de l'invalidité, on aurait un historique, mais euh, on a seulement ces individus qui ont reçu des bénéfices. Donc, il faut se rappeler déjà que cette question se pose de ceux qui sont absents, et je vais revenir à ça. Ce que, un autre exemple des, des recherches que ça a mené, ici on s'intéressait à l'effet du chômage euh, sur la santé, de, de l'expérience d'avoir vécu du chômage sur la santé des personnes plus âgées. Et ce qu'on voit euh, dans, dans cette étude, et comme je vous rappelle, on, dès 2012, on pouvait dans le fond prendre les individus de 65 ans et plus qui avaient répondu à l'enquête, et euh, retracer leur passé, leur historique de sources de revenus pour les 20 années passées. Et ce qu'on a vu quand on faisait cet historique, quand on regardait les différentes sources de revenus, donc euh, du revenu d'emploi, du revenu euh, d'assurance chômage, du revenu d'invalidité de, euh, de, et d'assistance sociale, les individus qui, dans le passé, n'avaient reçu que de l'assurance chômage et aucun autre type de, de bénéfice social, en fait, n'étaient pas différents dans leur risque de rapporter une mauvaise santé à l'âge, euh, parmi les âges plus avancés, à 65 ans et plus. Donc, ça suggère qu'il y a des processus, c'est un, un fait qui, euh, qui se voulait avérer que le chômage était négatif pour la santé. Or, ici, ce qu'on voit dans cette cohorte, c'est que si c'était que du chômage, donc potentiellement plus un choc, il n'y avait pas autant d'effets. Je vous mentionne ça pour dire l'importance d'avoir cette capacité de, de pouvoir regarder le passé alors qu'il se déroule. Et ça, c'est les enquêtes longitudinales qui nous l'offrent. Et euh, je vous ai mentionné que les enquêtes longitudinales, maintenant, étaient, euh, en fait, avec, il y avait un une volonté de les, les faire vivre, de faire continuer leur, euh, leur utilité pour la prise de décision. Et donc, euh, je vous montre ici, euh, malheureusement, des acronymes, mais pour les fins de la présentation, euh, j'espère que vous me pardonnerez, pour souligner toutes les possibilités d'appariement qui s'offrent maintenant à nous, qui s'offrent aux chercheurs, et beaucoup de ces données sont disponibles d'emblée dans les centres de données de recherche. Mais qu'est-ce que le futur nous, euh, nous offre? Alors que j'ai travaillé avec mes étudiants euh, à l'analyse de ces données, de, de ces données administratives, j'ai réalisé l'importance de bien comprendre les programmes et l'importance de comprendre les organismes qui ont ces, qui, qui soutiennent ces programmes et qui euh, soutiennent la, la prise de décision. Donc, euh, ce que je voudrais pour le futur, en fait, et je souhaite, et on, on est en train de le mettre sur pied, notamment avec le, le réseau canadien des centres de données de recherche et beaucoup d'autres partenaires que vous voyez ici, c'est qu'on on améliore les liens entre le, ceux qui prennent les décisions 
et euh, qu'on aille encore plus et, et l'université, mais en allant chercher les plus jeunes. Donc, euh, je pense que le futur se dessine avec ceux qui sont maintenant euh, à l'école, sur nos bancs d'école. Et donc, nous avons, euh, avec le financement du CRSH, eu la possibilité de développer un consortium qui permet la formation pour la prise de décision, le, le Candy 3, um, le Consortium on Analytics for Data Driven Decision Making. Et uh, on commence cette année. Et donc, um, le, ce que j'espère pour le futur, c'est que ces liens qui vont se former entre nos chercheurs, entre nos décideurs, vont être des liens qui vont être pérennes et qui vont créer une nouvelle ère de prise de décision éclairée à travers tous les secteurs de la société des gouvernements jusqu'aux euh, aux OBNL et au secteur privé et que ces, ces maillages qui vont se faire vont euh, perdurer. Donc, euh, je remercie les sources de financement qui m'ont permis de faire cette recherche et vous aussi de votre attention et merci d'avance de votre question. Merci beaucoup, uh, Emily. I, I think the, the focus on, in the literature on intergenerational, intergenerational income equality is welcome, but as your research highlights, uh, social determinants of health are also intergenerational. And in order to be able to answer those questions over many years, we need to be able to combine administrative and survey data as your research so uh, ably demonstrates. And it's certainly the case by looking at this work and similar work that the value of administrative data and the value of survey data combined is certainly greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, so our last speaker in this session is Jeff Latimer. He's the Director General and Strategic Advisor for Health Data at Statistics Canada. He holds a PhD in Criminology and a Master's Degree in Social Work, both of which focused on the intersection between health and justice. Jeff is currently focused on improvements in the quality, accessibility, and analysis of health data to better serve Canadians. So over to you, Jeff. Uh, thank you very much, Ted. Uh, let me first start by thanking the coordinating committee for this opportunity to participate in the 20th anniversary of the Canadian Research Data Centre Network. I have to tell you that I am a, uh, a real advocate of this network. I started my career many years ago as a researcher accessing data within the CRDCN. And then uh, later on in my career, I became the Director General of Strategic Initiatives at the Canadian Centre for Health Information, at Canadian Institutes of Health Information. And this is the organization along with the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, who's accountable to fund the CRDCN. And uh, I was uh, privileged to be the Director General uh, responsible for taking care of that funding. And so that was great. And now in my current role as the Director General of Health at Statistics Canada, I'm now accountable to ensure that I can put as much data into the CRDCN as possible for researchers to access. And in Statistics Canada, our core belief is really that data unaccessed is really not valuable. And so, um, so I'm going to start uh, by just giving you a quick overview of the CRDCN, just for those who may not know some of the statistics. Obviously established in 2000, given this is our 20th anniversary, but I think what's really critical to highlight is that researchers today have access to over 1,500 data sets in 35 research data center networks, uh, data centers across Canada. And I know my colleagues here at Statistics Canada are working with the network to add at least two or three more in the near future. Part of the network's mandate is training, and I think it's critical to highlight the important work they do in training approximately 400 research each and every year, training these researchers to really understand how to access and analyze Statistics Canada data and how to uh, employ appropriate quantitative methodology. So I think it's a really great, great uh, work. So I'm going to start by uh, flagging a few of the uh, examples in the health area that I think will highlight, I hope, the breadth and depth of the research that is available, or the data rather, that is available, and hopefully it'll encourage you to take a look. And so I'll start with the Canadian Census Environment Cohort. This is a, a great file that integrates uh, our census, both short and long form, but primarily the short form, uh, the long form rather, which really has lots of detailed information about socioeconomic status, occupation, population group, et cetera. When we're able to link that to some of our administrative health data, for example, uh, mortality data, we start to see some really important patterns. And this database also, I should flag, has many years of census. So it really has a strong uh, probabilistic linkage match. And so it's, it's, a, good, it's a good database. I've, I've chosen to highlight one small example within each of, these, uh, each of these databases, just to show you some of the innovative work that's been, been done over the years. And I think this one, uh, this is an interesting finding where based upon this database, we've been able to determine, the researcher rather has been able to determine that living in urban areas within about a quarter of a little kilometer of water 
in, uh, in urban centers really increases uh, the increases life expectancy and reduces the risk of mortality by 12 to 17 percent. I'm quite pleased with that given I live a few a few meters away from the Rideau River here in Ottawa. So that's a great finding. On the next uh, slide, I'm going to talk about the Canadian Health Measure Survey. This survey, I have to say, is probably my favorite uh, Statistics Canada database. Um, not as used as I would like to see. And so it really, it not only does it have household interview data on all sorts of self-reported uh, health status, behavior, housing, demography, all of these things, it has direct physical measurements. And we have trailers that travel across the country, um, gather data on about 6,000 Canadians each, uh, every two year period. Uh, these data are represented at the national level and sometimes at uh, large uh, regional levels. And so this data can be quite valuable to look at all sorts of relationships between risk factors, health status, public health issues. So I flagged one again, quite an interesting finding, I thought uh, in 2019, uh, the authors found no link actually between urban neighborhood walkability and BMI scores and in, no, in any population group except one, and that was uh, males age six to 17. And so traditionally one would have thought that walkability across uh, urban neighborhoods would increase uh, or decrease rather BMI, but in fact it is only in one small group. So in the next example, I'm just going to flag uh, an important uh, linkage that some of my colleagues already talked about, which is the census with vital statistics and the Canadian Cancer Registry. So you can imagine with the three databases, the power of this, uh, the analytical power available to you. Now we traditionally always link our vital statistics with our cancer so that we can calculate five year survival rates. But in this case, adding the census provides a tremendous power. And so in this small example uh, in 2014, it was found that there was a negative association between socioeconomic status and mortality amongst cancer patients. And so you can see the value of just, just with some small linkages and accessing the data, we can find some really important uh, uh, results for policymakers. On the last slide, I'm just gonna talk about a very broad health data integration file. I'm listed here all of the surveys uh, and you know, the community community health surveys, hopefully you're aware, 65,000 Canadians on an annual basis, uh, representative all the way down to the health region level. Sometimes people will access our two-year Canadian CCHS file, which is even more powerful. Adding all of these together, you can see some, uh, some tremendous possibilities uh, looking at all sorts of things. And in this one particular uh, study, looking at the uh, use of hospital services and not surprising, but important that we have empirical evidence to suggest that smoking and higher BMI and low socioeconomic status does carry an increased risk of avoidable hospitalization. So I hope with these examples, you've seen some of the power of these data. I'll, I'll conclude with just one small uh, slide on the future of the CRDCN and Statistics Canada's partnership. Now we are hoping, and as my colleagues have already indicated, virtual access to our uh, data is critical and we know that, and we're working quite closely with the network to see what we can do in the near future. Statistics Canada has also developed virtual data labs and these are hopefully um, innovative uh, spaces where researchers can virtually ask, virtually, um, examine Statistics Canada's data, while at the same time protecting confidentiality under the Act. Um, and then lastly, we're, there's a greater access to business data, hopefully in the near future. I think that's critical for some researchers and of course, enhanced training material. So this is the future of the CRDCN relationship with Statistics Canada. So I thank you for your time. I look forward to the question and answer period. Thank you very much, Jeff, for those great comments. I think your comments uh, really highlight the essential partnership between researchers and public officials that none of this happens, none of the progress that have been, that's been made over the last 20 years happens without the champions such as yourself within Statistics Canada. So I think it's important to highlight that this is a partnership and has been from the beginning. So this concludes the pre-recorded portion of the spotlight on population health and health services. We invite you to please stand by as we transition to the live question and answer session with our panelists. And if you have yet to do so, please submit your questions online. The live Q&A is starting now. Um, welcome back, everyone. We are, we are now live and in the 10 second break, we all managed to change our clothes for the question and answer session. Uh, so we've got some uh, questions coming in and I'm going to address them 
Um, the first one I think is addressed to all, but I think I might ask Jeff maybe to comment first, given he's worn multiple hats over the years. So the question is, the research and policy domains are sometimes viewed as two solitudes. How have you been successful in bridging the domains and what challenges remain? Yeah, that is a really good question. Um, given my, I've been uh, both a researcher, I've worked in policy departments, uh, I've worked in funding agencies and, and in Statistics Canada. And I do think that there traditionally has been uh, somewhat of a divide, but I will, I'll speak on behalf of my colleagues at uh, CIHR where I used to work. Um, and I noticed on the video that I, I called it the Canadian Institute for Health Information. I've never actually worked at CAI. I have no idea why I said that. Um, but uh, at CIHR, um, they have what I would consider to be one of the most innovative uh, tools to allow to make this bridge. It's called the Best Brains Exchange. And uh, this allows uh, policymakers who um, have uh, relatively important policy research questions to spend dedicated time with a select group of uh, academics, often from Canada, sometimes also internationally, and to uh, have a safe space to ask questions, to discuss statistics, candidate, all sorts of other data sources. But that's one that I think uh, is a model that works really well. Um, at the same time, uh, and again, going back to my old job at CIHR, but the idea of uh, the strategy for patient-oriented research is another example where um, embedding policy decision makers within research teams uh, right from the beginning, uh, I think, is uh, critical for developing both policy-relevant questions, for uh, allowing for appropriate knowledge translation, etc. So um, I think that would be what I would suggest at the, for now. Thanks, Ted. Great, thanks. Would anyone else on the panel like to comment briefly on that question? Emily? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, as, I, as I mentioned at the end of my presentation, I think it starts with training. And so we should get it going from the start. And I think it, it really, as, a, as Jeff pointed out, you know, trusted space, um, trust is really important. And we can start building trust by making sure that people understand each other. And that takes time. And so to provide spaces where people can engage uh, from different sectors, from different perspectives, and ensure that uh, the data to, de to decision-making pipeline um, happens at very early stages is something that we can really definitely encourage. And we're finding through uh, Candy3, through our training initiative, that there's a lot of appetite, um, not just in academia, but really outside of academia for the kind of trainees that, uh, that we produce and that, that can use these data in the most um, sophisticated way and, and provide the, the insights that will drive this decision making. So I think it's a win-win-win for all when we can start that early on and, um, and really value those, uh, those, those uh, paths for our trainees. Thank you. So the next question is, uh, is for the researchers, uh, Emily, Mohammed, and Kim. And it's kind of a Christmas comes early question. What data needs are highest on your wish list to advance your research and that of your colleagues and students? So maybe we'll start with Kim. You, you're at the uh, junction of many different flows of data. Um, what would be first on your wish list of what we don't have yet access to? Uh, so I, I think it, this, that this would resonate with the comments I, I made previously, which is some of this is just about being able to put different types of data sets together. So um, the data that I really want are going to, like I, I'm mostly a policy evaluation sort of person, quantitative within the healthcare setting, but I really want those social determinants of health data to complement the healthcare services utilization data because otherwise we just really don't, we can't understand the whys of, or the consequences of uh, those social determinants on uh, what people bring to the healthcare system as in the health inequities that are present and what the effects of the healthcare system are on them. I think the other big thing for me is less about the type of data and more connects to the previous question, which is the timeliness of the data. I think there has been a big move to try to make sure that we get um, data that are far more contemporaneous than they have been in the past. And even Statistics Canada has shown that with mortality data uh, provision really, really quickly in a context of COVID. I think we need to do more of that because it actually helps the policy connections as well. Great, thank you. Um, Mohammed, would you like to add something about your data wish list? Yeah, I think that uh, as I mentioned in terms of the, in terms of data that uh, I would like to have it, of course, I, uh, I, I rather to have a provincial data set that the 
if it's a data center, of course, it is, if it is possible, for example, medical service insurance, billing claims. And of course, that, uh, for example, in our province, we have a health data Nova Scotia that is actually, they are having that type of, uh, like, a, that type of data set. But I feel that having that one and, we, and, and also connecting, as Kim mentioned, to the other social determinant of health is, that, is, is something that, uh, uh, like, I would like to have in order to find, uh, in order to have a rich data set for, for my, uh, for, for my uh, research program. And, uh, and I think that, uh, like, as I mentioned as well, I think that uh, linked administrative data, having more of this one at the research data center as in fact is, I, I, I really value this type of, uh, this type of linked data set. And of course, that if you put the administrative data as a researcher, we can go ahead and link this administrative data to to different administrative data. But if if already it, this data set has been linked, it you can see that the use of this this type of data set is in fact it become it become more popular among the researcher because we don't need to spend a lot of time to link ourselves at the data center. And I think that yeah, these two are the thing that I I would like to have uh, that uh, research data center and of course more frequent uh, survey data set for example the, the for example we have a cchs mental health that is uh, like the which is 2012 it is uh, quite a while ago and having that one a bit more frequent considering the fact that we have uh, like a, a lot of focus on the mental health issue in canada is is something that uh, uh, like I appreciate to have very frequent type of uh, survey, especially specifically when it comes to the uh, issues that is uh, important for Canadian. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is for Jeff. Um, what are the health data gaps, and keeping on the same theme of, of health data or data gaps, what are the health data gaps that Statistics Canada sees as urgent priorities for Statistics Canada to fill? Thanks, Ted, for that question. I want to make a distinction before I answer that question. Um, Statistics Canada doesn't normally set data priorities. We identify gaps, but it's usually our policy departments like Health Canada or the Public Health Agency of Canada that work with us to identify the most urgent data priorities. So with that being said, this is more my own personal opinion than it is the position of the agency, but I would argue a couple of key points. Uh, one wouldn't be a data gap per se, but it would be more a, um, an integration of data. So the health data ecosystem is highly um, fractured, I would say in some ways. Um, if Statistics Canada collecting a number of population health uh, data surveys, uh, CCHS, CHMS, et cetera. Um, we also have administrative data like the birth, death, cancer. So you have a lot of population health data and then you have all of the health information data um, that's collected both at the provincial level and then nationally at the, uh, through the Canadian Institutes of Health Information. Again, not necessarily cohesively together. And then we have a lot of public health data collected by the Public Health um, Agency of Canada and its provincial counterparts. And so one of my uh, personal um, wishes of the future would be to see a much more integrated approach to health data so that all of these can combine together. And as I tried to demonstrate with my linkages, the power of that. The other thing I will say is um, mental health and children's health are two areas that I've seen that um, I think it was just it was just mentioned you know, the last mental health survey was quite some time ago. And so I think the children's health, mental health are both critical that probably we could uh, have more data on. Uh, I think I'll just leave it at that, Ted, thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question um, is, we'll start with Tim and then um, Emily, if you could weigh in as well. Understanding the health of Canadian children and long-term quality and programs for children with chronic conditions is best understood through longitudinal data. What are the best opportunities to improve access to longitudinal analysis relevant to child health? Good to see we're, we're going straight to the simple questions, hey? Um, is a really, this is a really important question and I, I mean the longitudinal nature of things is important and I, I think what you're speaking to is both the sort of current understanding of child health and development but also the longer term implications of um, experiences in childhood so those those are kind of two different frames for how longitudinal the longitudinal really needs to be and and the latter of course means taking a full life course uh, perspective which i do think is we, we have the capability of doing that so would um we should try to pursue that so i actually think this this kind of thing probably 
needs um, attention to create an actual um, data system that could support a whole um, range of analyses. So in other words, what I'm saying is perhaps what we should be thinking about is not necessarily a project specific data development system, but something that could sort support a larger program of research undertaken by a number of different um, researchers or even a number of different disciplines of researchers who are working together from different angles to uh, understand a particular problem. So this, I think, kind of speaks to what I was saying before about the need to um, find a way to connect um, provincially held resources and territorially held resources with the uh, what Statistics Canada has and really even bringing in the private sector. Um, but I do think this is a collective action um, kind of problem, not an individual research project kind of problem. Thanks. Uh, Emily, did you want to add anything on this? Yeah, well, I think there's already a, an opportunity with um, the NLSCY, the National Longitudinal Survey of Children and Youth, uh, that has now been linked to some um, administrative data records. So those those kids have been followed already for a long period of time in their um, childhood and their youth. And now we can see the social and potentially eventually the health um, effects if we get to linkage with the administrative health records. But certainly we have mortality, but they're fortunately still too young to show much of that. And so it will be, I think, th th this kind of inno innovative, innovative, um, wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. It, uh, this is the kind of stuff that StatCan has been doing that really allows for these surveys to live on. And I um, just also wanted to you know, kind of add to, uh, to Kim's point that this is really a team sport when, we start, when we're starting to look at these various fields and um, psychological development, but also um, biological development. And there have been initiatives, uh, notably in epigenetics, that really need this kind of um, confluence of bench scientists and also um, social scientists coming together. And um, they have been maybe a little bit more um, open in some ways to sharing their, um, their various cohorts in order to drive the numbers up. And so I think we can learn from that. And I guess my final point to the, the previous question would be also not to ask uh, so much a, a wish list of the, of the what, uh, data, but also the how. How can we better access data? And so here I'm just going to throw, you know, the pavé dans la mare with um, saying, well, you know, remote access, uh, opening that kind of access is something that's going to be really critical, I think, looking to the future, because we have tons of data already available, and I suspect not nearly as used as, uh, as they could be, not as mobilized as they, uh, as they should be at this point. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is about um, students, trainees, and we might start with Mohamed. Um, and so in your experience, um, how can CRDCN further strengthen their engagement with RDC student users? We're, we're widely recognized for the number of students using the RDC, but how do we first further strengthen that engagement with students? Um, I think that uh, RDC has already, as you, ju as, as you just mentioned already, is instrumental in terms of capacity building of the future healthcare researcher and health researcher. And in terms of the, like a, how, for example, RDC can further, for example, can be of help in terms of the, like capacity building of the, like new, like a new type of trainee. I think that, uh, I think, I think that the, what I've seen here is that most of the time, like a, like those people that the researcher that they are trying to come into the RDC as well, RDC, they are, they are dealing with the, with a lot of, uh, not, not necessarily a, a lot of, I can say that with some issue in terms of access rules and everything in order to get to the RDC and use the data set. And I think that facilitating that process to access to the data set can be, can be quite helpful. For example, if, my training in order to get to the RDC, it takes some of them wait for six months to get access to the data set. So I guess like uh, if you somehow shorten this type of, uh, the, this type of, uh, uh, shorten the time, the, the, uh, the process of the access to the data center is, is one of the, one of the actually important in, like play a major role in terms of access to the to, to the data center and 
and also is starting to do the analysis. For example, if you are thinking about master students, they have one year to go ahead and do the analysis in some, in some programs or one and a half years. If they are going to end up to have a, to, to wait for six months to access to the data and they don't have enough time to go ahead and do the, to do the, their analysis. And I think that shortening that type of, uh, that uh, shortening this period is, can, can be instrumental and help more more students to get uh, like uh, somehow interested to use the data center and of course that I know that for example RDC has some sort of like a uh, like research especially software training and everything that in the past my students has been used this type of uh, program as well and I really appreciate that one because not all of the students they come to the uh, like uh, to use the data center they have uh, they have uh, in, enough training to use the to use the data, to use the data at the research data center. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm trying to encourage this fly to land on my head so I can trend on Twitter as well, but I haven't had any luck. Next question, Jeff, yeah, this is a tough one, I think. Okay. Um, I'm very interested in studying maternal health, but Statistics Canada collected limited data on the subject in the last 10 to 15 years. It's very important and linked to child development research. What are your thoughts? Yeah, that's actually not as hard a question, I think, as, um, well, it may not be a good answer, actually. That's probably what I'll say. Um, I'll start by uh, saying that um, we, you know, this sounds like a horrible bureaucratic answer, but we have a very stable base budget that Statistics Canada operates under for health research, health statistics, rather. And, um, you know, it's enough to fund our core programs, which includes vital statistics, uh, that is birth, death, stillbirth, um, coroner's data. And then uh, we have cancer, and then we have our uh, major survey programs. And then there's a small amount to do some linkage and some indicator work and stuff. But generally speaking, we rely on uh, new funds to conduct anything beyond that core program. And so oftentimes the priorities that I, I said earlier in my earlier comment, the priorities that we focus on are generally from those who unfortunately or fortunately, depends how you look at, have the resources to be able to um, ask Statistics Canada to conduct those. So I said, you know, children's, uh, children's and mental health are two, I think, uh, gaps personally. And recently we've, uh, we just finished a children's survey. It's the worst acronym in history called Cheesy, and that's been released. And uh, we're in the middle of conducting a mental health survey on behalf of the Public Health Agency of Canada. But the, the challenge is, is that these require um, resources. And so it sounds very bureaucratic, but I, I, I understand that, that it is true. I'll acknowledge that there hasn't been a lot of maternal health uh, data, but um, all I can say really is I would love to uh, and address every single gap that exists uh, in the health field. And unfortunately we have to prioritize. And so it's not a great answer, but uh, thank you for the question. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is for Emily and Mohammed. Um, how is the growing recognition of the importance of the social and economic determinants of health heightened the opportunities for an important South RDC-based research? Well, um, I think it answers itself, right? Uh, this is, it's just been a wonderful evolution to see it happen uh, from the time I started using the, actually I started using StatCan data in 1994, but then um, the RDCs in 2004 when I came back um, from doing my PhD in the States. And um, at the time when I was proposing to work on health services and equity, it absolutely, it almost was a non-starter. And um, in fact, I wanted to study health insurance. So your, your um, you know, access to private health insurance in Canada and, and what that did to, um, to people's access to healthcare. And uh, I recall having a conversation with someone at Statistics Canada, who shall remain, remain unnamed, who told me, oh, welcome back to Canada. We don't have private health insurance here. And I thought, oh, well, there is, you know, there is a ways to go in terms of bringing a consciousness uh, uh, about this, these potential inequalities that are generated. And so in the past, over the past 15 years, it's been, I think a massive, um, there's been massive openness and recognition of where those, um, those fault lines can, um, can really come in. And so it's been wonderful to see and just exciting to see the field uh, moving in that direction. So yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely played a big role in, in uh, supporting our, my research and that of my students. I suspect that question was planted by CRDCN staff. <laughs> um, before we go to you, Mohammed, uh, just quickly notice um, so we, because the questions are still coming in, 
um, which is great. Um, we are going to continue till two or uh, 15 minutes past the hour. Um, and so if you do have to leave, that's, that's fine, but uh, we will be drawing a hard line um, at 15 minutes past the hour, but you are more than welcome to stay and continue and our panelists are gonna be available until that time. So um, Mohamed, did you wanna add anything on, on that last question? Uh, I think uh, like as Emily mentioned in the past, uh, like I, I'm here in Canada for 10 years and I can, I can mention about the trend that I have seen in terms of the study that they are doing in terms of the social determinant of health and as well as doing the inequity analysis in health and healthcare. And I think that you like it just, uh, it's a, you can easily see that like there are quite a lot of study that are addressing this issue in Canada. And I think that part of the, uh, part of the us as a researcher here is that to go ahead and do this inequity analysis and bring this one up. And because if we don't measure this one, the policymaker won't know that, uh, don't know that this such an inequity exists in Canadian healthcare and as well in Canadian healthcare system. And I feel that uh, um, having, the, having the rich data set, both uh, like survey data set and administrative data set, and of course this link to the uh, like survey data set linked to administrative data set is actually uh, has been quite uh, helpful in terms of the producing the producing the research that uh, in, that uh, that highlight socioeconomic inequality in health and healthcare in Canada and I think that uh, we are moving toward that direction in terms of the producing more evidence and of course is the producing the like just uh, like uh, just going ahead and saying that socioeconomic inequality exists is one thing, but of course we are moving toward the finding what factors actually explain the socioeconomic inequality that exists in order to tailor the policy implication to reduce this inequity. So I think that, yeah, so it has been quite a change since I moved to Canada. Thank you. Um, so the next question, um, and we'll start with Kim and then I would invite others if they want to weigh in. Um, so previously, Statistics Canada told us that they use crowdsourcing as a source of qualitative data, but we don't usually see initiatives that allow citizens to indicate what kind of data, what kind of type, what type of questions they would like to be asked to describe their conditions. Would uh, Kim, would you have any thoughts on um, the value in citizen-driven data production and gathering efforts by Statistics Canada? Yeah. So, so in your, the, the question is specifically about. Um, person-generated data, not person-generated questions. Okay, so, um, so, so this is clearly a, a, a highly um, developing and rapidly developing area. In some cases, we refer, refer to it as citizen science, um, different from the citizen science of counting birds and seeing wildlife and more about actually contributing um, perspectives, information, the data that can complement um, what already exists. And this seems to me kind of goes back to some of the things Emily was pointing out in her presentation is this kind of really beautiful combination if you can take survey or crowdsourced information and link it to other sources. So it becomes quite complementary information and just helps us to tell more nuanced and more informative stories. Um, and by stories, I don't mean non empirically based, I just mean that we can animate our um, sort of more blunt or seemingly sometimes boring, although I never think they're boring, but the statistical information with actual experiences and provide more nuance to our interpretations by understanding some of the more details of experiences. So I think this is a really, really important thing to do. And it's so impressive what Statistics Canada has been able to do during the course of the pandemic and seeing the response from the public to those crowdsourced uh, kinds of questions. Um, and I might turn this around, Jeff, and go to you next. Um, do you think there's a scope for Statistics Canada to, to get input from citizens on the questions that Statistics Canada is asking, as well as the data? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I will, let me just uh, talk about a couple things. First, there isn't a single question that we ask at Statistics Canada that doesn't go through what's called a quality data review process. And these are focus groups with uh, Canadian citizens. And so all of our questions are tested with uh, actual citizens. And so they have an opportunity to provide us with their thoughts around how we word things, what, how, what labels we use, etc. So that's always done. Um, I would like to talk, uh, and, and also like, for example, in the census, we've started uh, many years ago, started to do some community uh, 
uh, boards. Uh, people can respond and ask questions about data and, and participate. And so we are focused on trying to bring citizens more uh, directly into the process and also enhance, uh, I would say, science literacy or statistical literacy. That's a huge, uh, important thing for us. One last point. Um, uh, in the health area, we do have an interesting pilot project. I don't really have much uh, knowledge on it right now, but it's called BYOD, Bring Your Own Data. And so there's this interesting participatory approach to a data analysis, but I don't have enough details. I apologize for that teaser. Thanks, Ted. Great, thanks. Um, so the next question is on um, COVID-19. And um, so the COVID crisis has highlighted the need for rapid response capability for researchers to inform critical public health policy issues. And on that, Statistics Canada has been great at getting data out very quickly. What lessons are we learning uh, as a result from the perspectives of both CRDC and, and Statistics Research mm -hmm. Community and Statistics Canada? I'll, I'll leave that as an open one. If anyone would like to respond to that by putting your hand up, it's a, specifically around um, lessons around COVID and through the COVID crisis. Would anyone like to? Uh, Kim. I'll be very quick and, and succinct with this, which is just to say, I think the pandemic, if it's showed us anything, it's that change is possible and change is possible on a far faster timeline than we might have admitted previously. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Oh, add anything? Go ahead. Yeah, I think that uh, another thing is that probably this COVID uh, issue that we are dealing with that, uh, in, this is in line with what I already like vision for our, uh, like uh, for access to the data set at the RDCs is virtual access to the data set, right? So we have been like those people, they were using the RDC center. It has been uh, like, a, it, it has been quite a, like a closing down, a, like closure of the RDC. It has had an impact in terms of the research productivity of the, like those who are using this data center. And I think that uh, so maybe the moving to the virtual uh, access, uh, as we highlighted and Jeff also mentioned, uh, like uh, this COVID actually <laughs> uh, somehow has helped us to realize that how important for us is that to get, gain access to the virtual access of data set, data. So it doesn't matter. So we are in the situation that uh, like if any COVID, for example, related data set is available at the RDC by having access to the virtual data set, the virtually, virtually accessing to data, we can produce some information that can be used policy, that can inform policy to act on. So I think that uh, maybe this is one of the, one of the, uh, I can say that uh, but one of, one of the, one of the, one of COVID somehow helped us to understand the, how important for us to access to the data center, the data center virtually. Great. I don't know whether I answered the question that uh, they mentioned, but. Yeah. Um, just the. Uh, yeah, oh. you know, yeah, thanks, Ted. Uh, really briefly, I'll try. I just want to reiterate something Kim said. Uh, I think the art of the possible. I think we've realized uh, that things are a little bit more possible than we uh, used to think. So, for example, I'll give you a really quickly the mortality data. So we collect data from uh, on deaths across the country um, and we use a, almost a real-time system, but the coverage is so poor, we've always taken about 22 months to release those data after the reference period and, um, and then much, much longer to get into the RDC. And now uh, during COVID, we've realized the importance of excess deaths during the pandemic. And so we, we can see within a month of the death event occurring, it's in literally uh, published and we've put a file in the RDC. And so... But I do want to caution one thing is that we've learned all of this and timeliness is critical, but with, uh, with the um, shortening of time, there's often a potential for a decrease in quality. And so the coverage of those death data are, are not nearly where they should be in terms of releasing publicly. You know, these are not our national counts of deaths in Canada, but they are important for researchers. So as long as people understand the, the quality um, trade-off, uh, then I think it's critical. Thanks. Great. Um, Jeff, we're going to stay with you. Uh, we have a couple of um, specific questions for about Statistics Canada processes. Um, the first one, um, since Statistics Canada is moving towards data distribution through virtual networks, does it mean that researchers from universities that do not have an RDC will be able to get access to the RDC data? That's a great question. Uh, I'm not the person to be able to answer that. We have um, directors general and directors at Statistics Canada that are working on this project. All I can say is, uh, yes, uh, virtual data laboratories are calling them right now, VDLs, they are being tested right now with um, some clients. 
Um, so the, the goal is hopefully at some point in the future, uh, researchers will be able to um, sit for, uh, in a particular, I'm not sure exactly how the physical part will work, but they will be able to access the data virtually. Uh, whether or not, I, I can't imagine that we would not extend that. We just would need to have processes in place in those institutions that don't have a, a research data center. So similar um, uh, paperwork, et cetera. So I, I can't answer officially, I apologize, but I suspect unofficially it should be feasible. Yeah, I think I can just add very quickly. Um, technically, it should be possible. Procedurally, it's something that would be worked out with CRDCN um, about the process through which non-RDC universities would get access. Um, just staying with you, Jeff, very quickly. Um, one question was, why was what happened to the NPA National Population Health Survey, and why was it replaced by the? Yeah, that's a, so uh, I was here at Statistics Canada when the National Population Health Survey decision was made to, to cancel that survey. And uh, really, there was two reasons. Uh, the sample was deteriorating to such a point where we did not feel the quality was there. In other words, the, uh, those who were dropping out weren't just dropping out because of death uh, they, or, or moving out of the country. They just were not responding anymore. And so you start with a great cohort uh, to follow longitudinally and within 15, 12, 15 years, that cohort shrinks to such a point that it's no longer accurate and no longer representing um, uh, the, po the, the, the population you're hoping to study. And so that was the first point. I mean, the second point was this idea of record linkage allowed us to continue to follow those individuals uh, through administrative data. So we can continue to track those and those cohorts are staying intact. And um, so if you look at tax data or hospitalization data, or mortality data, they will always be there in the future through that administrative link as opposed to relying on contacting them in their homes. And lastly, um, we're finding that uh, response rates in Canada are declining and you know, our business is, is survey, a lot of our business is surveys and you know, we rely on the goodwill of Canadians to spend a lot of time with us on the computer, the phone or at their door. And uh, these, the times of 65 minute, 70 minute CCHS surveys are really uh, a challenge and our, our response rates, we don't wanna see them drop to a point where we're no longer comfortable. So we're working on all sorts of ways to address that. So I think that should answer it, thanks. Great, um, thank you. Um, so that is the end of our Q and A. Um, before, before I thank the speakers, I'm gonna invite each of you, if you'd like to have some final comments or uh, pearls of wisdom in a minute, uh, I'd like take a minute or so and we will finish before 15 minutes past the hour. But before I do turn to the panelists, just to announce um, the next session of the CRDCN 20th anniversary virtual conference is going to be held on October 19th at 1 p.m. Eastern time and is focused on gender issues. So any final comments, we can start with uh, Emily. Um, so I guess I would just end by saying that it's a huge privilege to have access to the data that we have and that um, I hope that everybody um, takes advantage of it within the confines, of course, of ethics and privacy and respect for the respondents who have given us access to these data and to all the staff who have worked to collect the administrative data. Um, that, that we're using, and of course, the CRDCN folks um, all across the country making it available to us. Thanks. Uh, Kim, final comments? Yeah, um, so just a, a thanks for um, great questions and for my fellow panelists and for the invitation to be here. It's been really fun and informative for me. And I, I think, you know, the, I think the, the future looks really, really interesting. The, the development of virtual access is going to be a huge step forward when that is made possible. And I think that will trigger all sorts of other possibilities too. And then the last thing I'd say is if, if nothing else about 2020 has, um, been a lesson it's that predicting what's going to happen over the next few years is really really tricky and I'm not going to do it but I fully anticipate that um, we'll see some significant innovations coming from CRDCN and StatCan in general and I really look forward to uh, being hopefully being uh, part of um, how we can move things forward. Great thanks and Jeff. Well, thanks, Ted. Uh, let me just say two points. One, uh, I was not the unnamed person that Emily spoke to at Statistics Canada uh, around that insurance issue. And number two, I just want to thank everybody for, uh, it's a privilege for me as a public servant to be able to attend these kinds of conferences with such esteemed academic uh, colleagues. And so thank you for allowing me to uh, attend and participate. Thanks. And the final word from the panel, uh, Mohamed. Uh, uh, I would like to thank you for having me here as well. And I am as the other also panelists mentioned, we are really thankful to have uh, such a 
useful data set hosted at the research data center. And I think that uh, uh, like this uh, data set is quite has helpful for those people, those researchers that they are doing quantitative research. And more specifically, they are trying to find uh, uh, like ways in order to inform policymakers to improve the health of Canadians. So right. thank you for thank you for having this infrastructure in Canada. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to all, uh, all the panelists and to the audience and to the people posing questions. And I'd also like to thank the CDR, CRDCN team behind the scenes, Grant, Joe, Michelle, Chloe, and Martin for making all this um, come together really smoothly. So just one last reminder about this. Sign up for the next session on October 19th. And thank you again, and we'll see you soon.